Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl Podcast is sponsorship and ad-free thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting your favorite podcast and becoming a patron, please check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast and help me to increase the amount of female role models in the media. All patrons will get their name on a dedicated patrons page on the Tough Girl website. All female patrons, $5 and above, are invited to join the close Facebook group, the Tough Girl Tribe. New episodes go live every Tuesday and Thursday at 7am UK time. Today, I'm delighted we're going to be speaking with Patricia Alsavar, who is a professional boxer turned mountaineer. Just as a content warning, we do talk about verbal abuse and leaving an abusive situation. Hi, I'm Patty Alcivar, also known as Patty Boom Boom. That is my professional boxing name. I am a former two-time New York City Golden Gloves champion, a USA national and world champion in boxing. And I was the first female ever to be voted Athlete of the Year by the United States Olympic Committee in boxing, which is an amazing honor. And it's something that I will hold dear forever. And I am also a competitor competitive runner. I ran my first marathon at the age of 16. My biggest passion right now, I consider myself a mountaineer, a mountain climber um, with the goal of becoming the first Latina from New York City to climb the seven summits of the world. I have three down so far, Kilimanjaro, Aconcagua, and Elbrus. And I have four more to go, which also includes Everest. Um, I also have been um, living in New York City on my own since I was 16 years old. So uh, I'm definitely a very proud New Yorker. And I feel like if I have not been living in the city of New York, as tough as New York City is, I think that's part of what's made me, you know, who I am today. Take us back to when you were 16 and, you know, running your first marathon, living alone in New York City. Tell us more about that. Like what got you into running? Why did you want to run a marathon? How did that combine with you living by yourself? My mom became a single mom of four girls, and we lived in a two-bedroom apartment, and our us four sisters lived in one bedroom. So it was uh, pretty cozy <laughs> at times, and uh, my dad was removed when I was 10 years old from our home. So at a young age, we did a lot of chores, and one day after washing the dishes, on the Sunday afternoon, it was my turn to flip the channels and and to decide what we were going to watch because I had just washed the dishes. And um, I was hypnotized when I saw this woman crossing the finish line. I had not known that what I was watching was the finish of the Boston Marathon, which is one of the most prestigious and the oldest marathons in the world. And I saw this lady crossing the finish line and it was just so inspiring to me. And I remember And I was like 14 and a half ish. And I remember saying under my breath, I'm like, I'm going to do that one day. And everybody started laughing at me (laughs) because I come from a a South American family, Colombia, South America. And really, women are not really supposed to be athletes or doing any of that stuff that's considered, you know, very non traditional. So, the next day, I've always been, that, that's been my personality to be spunky and kind of rebellious. The next day I got up, um, I didn't even have running sneakers and I went running at 5 a.m. by myself. And I remember getting this ridiculous, horrible stitch on the side of my ribs. But I came back and I remember just feeling like this amazing, adrenaline. And for that moment while I was running, nothing mattered. And like, I didn't remember the pain that I was living at home at the time. So I took it upon myself to every other day um, run on my own. And by the end of like three months, I was running five kilometers. And then I took it a step further and, you know, and 
by a year had passed and I had been running consistently. And I talked to a few people and um, I actually went up to the New York Roadrunners, which is one of the biggest companies, event companies in the world that produces the New York City Marathon. I spoke to the president of the company and um, he was inspired by, <laughs> by what I was telling him about my situation at home and things like that. So I got a free entry to the New York City Marathon. I ran the New York City Marathon when I was 16, and um, it was incredible. And I knew there that if I could do that, I could do anything. And I was living in a really bad situation at home. Like I said, my father wasn't there anymore, and I feel like my mom just was overwhelmed taking care of four girls and she also became verbally abusive and I just one day after I ran the New York City Marathon picked up my things my my running trophy the little clothes that I had and I just rented a room in a lady's home uh she was like 80 years old she rented a room in her apartment and that's how it all started for me it was a very lonely to be there by myself but I felt like many times like I was alone, but I was in peace. No one was yelling at me. And I felt like at home, I was just drowning in the memories of my father and then my mom and things like that. So that's how it all, like, you know, I think it was a combination. The running helped me kind of heal from what was happening at home. And I got the courage to just leave an abusive situation. What happened next with your with your running like and your and your fitness like how did that progress how did you have time for fitness because were you working a job as well to support yourself Yes of course so uh, like I said I think I'm very spiritual I'm very faithful um I think that that's a big part of my strength and since I was small at a very young age I always felt like someone from above was just like poking me to just keep moving forward no matter what. I was diagnosed with ADD when I was uh, very young, when I was like six, seven years old. Um, I had trouble focusing in school and my parents had a very, uh, didn't um, have a wealth of resources and they didn't have a lot of money. So the counselor had told them at the time to try and find an extra curriculum curriculum activity after school that would help drain the excess energy that I had. And if that didn't work, then they would try and see about medication. So my first sport ever at like six, seven years old was ballet. And that helped a little bit. But when the ballet program was over, then um, there was a gymnastics program and that helped. But then I took it upon myself. Um, I was walking one day by myself and I saw a karate, a martial arts studio. And that just, I don't know, that just drew my attention and that caught my attention. And I signed up for it. I begged my mom and and I, I went into martial arts and my focus, my character, my personality changed because the more intense the activity was, that's what helped me excel and blossom. So I, I was in martial arts um, right before I started with the running. And I was, I happened to be <laughs> really good at it. And almost uh, simultaneous, around 16, 17 years old, I won a world title in full contact. It was called Kyokushin Karate. It's a Japanese full contact style. And I won a world title in, I remember, in Manhattan Center in 1993, 1994. And that combined with the running was just like an amazing outlet. That's what it is, an outlet for me. But because of my personality, <laughs> when there's nothing more to do with something, I get it's, I, I don't want to say bored, but it's just like, okay, where do I take it from here? And I, if there's if there's no answer to that, then I have to look for something else. 
while I left home, I started working for my first job, which I had to lie about my age. And (laughs) I worked at a domestic violence shelter called um, Sanctuary for Families. I got the job. I don't know how. I think they just saw the desperation in my face um, that I needed a job and I got it. And while I was working there, the staff was offered free classes to a place called the New School, which is a university and they offer everything that you can possibly think of from writing classes, languages, and just workshops. And I was uh, flipping through the catalog and something just jumped out at me from the catalog and it was the art of boxing. And I was like, whoa, I just remembered it just had flashbacks that when I was a kid, I used to watch boxing on TV with my father. My father was a huge boxing fan and um, I just like, I don't know, it just jumped out at me. So I signed up for it right away and, and I went to the class and I was super upset because it ended up being like a box aerobics class. And I remember that right after the class, the instructor um, was like this guy, huge guy, six foot five, 250 pounds, huge. And he's like, okay, kids, see you next week. And I'm like, no, you won't. And, And he was like, what do you mean? You didn't like the class? I'm like, I hated it. (laughs) And this guy was like, disbelief. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I thought this was going to be like a fighting class. I thought I was going to fight. And then he's like, uh, he was confused. He's like, you see, and then I said to him, you know, I'm a martial arts champion. And I thought that this might be something maybe for me to better my punches or for me to take it to the next level. And then he's like, okay, let me see what you have. Come over here. And he's like, throw any punches you want at me. And I was throwing punches after punches and he was blocking it. But I knew that the one place that you can't build muscle, no matter how big you are, is your solo plex. So I punched him as hard as I could in the solo plex. And um, this is a six foot five guy, huge. And he, he bent over and he looked up at me and he said, okay, so women's boxing just became legal in New York City. He's like, I'm going to train you how to fight. So um, that was it. <laughs> and, um, and he started training me. And within the first six months, um, I, we, he signed me up for my first New York City Golden Gloves tournament. And my first boxing match, I knocked out the girl within the first, was it the first, the first round. And boxing became something that challenged me in every way possible, spiritually, physically, and mentally. And that was what, you know, what I was looking for. If I'm not challenged, I feel like I'm wasting my time. And it definitely challenged me. And I took boxing as far as I possibly could. Unfortunately, boxing, women's boxing is not a lucrative sport just because we're women. I like I, I I was very accomplished as an amateur boxer. Um, like I said, I went to New York City Golden Gloves, won the first ever USA Nationals, international championships, and then I turned professional, and I won the New York State title right here in my hometown. But I wasn't really. Um, making the money that I should. I really did love the sport, but the politics and everything surrounding it was something that was um, very upsetting. In one of my last fights a year and a half ago, I went to my opponent's hometown and I was winning the fight. And in boxing, literally, the first time is always a warning and you can get away with murder. And the girl jumped up, intentionally headbutted me, opened up a gash, a six inch gash above my left eye. And in boxing, if there is a quote unquote accidental headbutt before the end of the fourth round, it ruled a no contest. So they stopped the fight. 
<laughs> and nobody won. And that was really, really upsetting to me. And the injury that I had, you really needed to take some time off or else it will reopen again just by a slight touch. So I took the opportunity to concentrate on something else. And I had already loved hiking. And um, the person, my boss at the time, she gave me a birthday gift. And it was my first mountaineering, alpine climbing experience in Utah. And my first time putting on crampons, I summited Mount Superior in Utah. And I remember the guide being like in disbelief. He's like, I haven't had a first time client um, summit this mountain before. And I just remember going back home and not being able to to not think about it. I was just really in love with the whole experience with the mountains. And within a few months from that, I, I did my first expedition in Ecuador. I summited the mount, all the mountains there in five high altitude mountains in 10 days. And I just remember just wanting to go back and back. It was being as close as I could to my higher power and just not thinking about anything else. And with between the beauty and the challenges of the high altitude Alpine mountains, I just felt cleansed and healed for those moments. So I remember asking uh, one of my guys, like, I don't want to stop this. I want to take this to the highest possible level what is that? And he's like, have you read the book Seven Summits? Or do you know what that is? And then I said, no. So he's like, I would read the book first and then you decide. And I remember <laughs> um, searching for the book immediately and doing some research and then finding out that it's the highest peak in each continent. And that at the time, 300 people worldwide had accomplished it. I knew right away inside that that's where I wanted to take it. So um, that's been my journey since that um, I started that journey in 2017. Um, and I have summited three of the seven so far, Kilimanjaro for Africa, Aconcagua for South America, and Elbrus for Europe. You know, if everything goes well and the pandemic allows, I am set to go to Denali in Alaska this summer in June. Tell us a little bit more about climbing the mountains in Ecuador. What's what's it like over there? Were you climbing um, with groups, with a guide? Were you, do, you know, doing it by yourself? What was it like over there for climbing? My family originally is from Colombia. So Ecuador, when I went to Ecuador for the first time, it was an amazing experience. And again, I was just starting it with my first expedition. So it definitely had to be guided. And Ecuador has amazing alpine, glaciated, um, high altitude mountains. You have um, one of the highest active volcanoes in the world called Cotopaxi, which is at 19,400 feet. Um, it has Cayambe, which is at 19,000 feet as well. And it has one of the technically when measured from the center of the earth, because Ecuador is located right at the equator of the center of the earth, they have a mountain called Chimborazo. So technically, when measured from the center of the earth is the highest mountain in the world. So I climbed all of those. And between the culture and the mountains, it was an incredible experience. Definitely not easy, but it was my real first taste of what it is to be at a high altitude, you know, with the dangers of the crevasses of the weather, the inclement weather. So it, it is a beautiful country. And that's where I have um, in the past few years gone, um, traveled often to train. I was reading on your website that one of your biggest struggles is actually patience when you're out sort of climbing mountains. How is your patience at the moment? Have, have you become a more patient person? Oh, yes. So I definitely in the past um, and still sometimes I can't say that I'm perfect. I do struggle with 
patience when I want something done, you know, right away. But that's one of the other, uh, one of the many reasons I love about mountain climbing is that it has humbled me big time and taught me patience. And it's not when I want it, it's when, you know, the mountain allows me to be able to climb because, you know, you can be the most well-prepared athlete or person or climber. And just because you're prepared doesn't mean that you're going to be able to climb. If the weather doesn't allow, then you're not going to climb. My first time, I uh, the first time on Chimborazo, I was 600 feet away from the summit and we had to turn around and I was like in tears. I was telling my guide, no, 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 we're 600 feet away. He's like 600 feet can take us three hours. I'm like three hours, 600 feet. I'll, I'll run that on the, a lap on the track, like in, <laughs> like in 30 seconds. He's like 600 feet on this mountain will take us three hours. And with the weather coming in right now, we have to turn around. So it definitely humbled me to just an amazing place. Um, now I've been climbing high altitude mountains for now five years. And every time it's just a new um, valuable life lesson that I learned on the mountain. So yes, it definitely has taught me patience and humility and just so many other things. <laughs> what goes through your head when you're climbing? Oh my gosh. Well, one of the things that mountain climbing does is almost like, it, and depends if it's a, a technical mountain or not, but you have to be fully focused, fully focused, because if you're not stepping right with your crampons and you miss a step, you know, you can put yourself and your team, if you're climbing with other people, in danger. Um, usually on high altitude mountains, going towards the summit, you're roped up. Either you're roped up with other team members or you're roped up with your guide. But if you take one bad step and you slide off, you're putting yourself and other people in danger. So the mountain is told, has taught me to just focus focus on, you know, the task at hand. And because of my ADD, because of my personality, because of my history, sometimes my my mind has um, tends to wander and think of so many things. But when I'm on the mountain, I'm thinking about the mountain, really, just like on being safe, on doing everything as perfectly as I could. Um, once I get to the summit, then it's just, to me, it's just so emotional. I don't remember not like, <laughs> like fully just crying and bawling at the summit just because at that time of the summit, then all the pain and all the things from my past, just for that moment, just everything makes sense. Tell us about climbing Kilimanjaro, which you summited in 2017. What was that experience like for you? Kilimanjaro, even though it was a short, a short trip. I was supposed to summit in six to seven days, which is usual, usually the average. I was on a budget. I didn't go with the big expedition companies. I researched and I found a small local company called a Trekking Hero, and we were. It was supposed to be, I think, a group of eight or ten people. And I remember arriving there, and it was just me and my guide, Emmanuel. And I'm like, uh, where's the rest of the people? He's like, they canceled. They moved their trip for next week. So it's just you and I. I'm like, really? <laughs> I'm like, okay, awesome. So, you know, we started and they have this thing like pole pole, like step by step, easy, slowly does it. Um, where um, you're supposed to go easy and slowly and um, because of my personality and just my, I think, part of my fitness, just everything. I think every check mark that we were supposed to go, checkpoint, we arrived three, four hours early. And I remember Emmanuel saying to me, he's like, we'll go at your pace, but you're going way too fast. And I'm like, but I feel good. I, I, I can, I can hold this. So, um, he had asked me, do you want to continue like 
straight to the summit. I'm like, yes, I want to go straight to the summit. I feel good. And this is what I want to do. So we summited in two days. I mean, we did the whole Kilimanjaro in two days. It was an amazing experience. <laughs> um, the summit was just amazing. And because I finished early, I didn't, I was able to, um, they, they gifted me a safari trip, a, um, a trip to the coffee where they make coffee and I think the waterfalls. So, <laughs> so Kalamajara was an amazing experience and it was the first of my seven summits, but I think that how can I say this? Um, some people get very confused with if when they go to Kilimanjaro, because Kilimanjaro is not technical. People, it's just the altitude that gets you, but it's not the uh, essential of ma- mountaineering because there's uh, porters and things like that. I remember on my Ecuador expedition, a couple had just come back from Kilimanjaro and they came to Ecuador. And in Ecuador, it was a five mountain expedition. They weren't able to summit one. And I remember that after the trip, she got on the bus and she sold all her equipment. And she's like, I don't ever want to see an alpine mountain again. <laughs> And it's because she had come from Kilimanjaro and she thought that, oh, yeah, me and my husband summited Kilimanjaro and now we're, you know, now we can we can do any mountain. And that's not that's not the case. Kilimanjaro has um, snow and it's glaciated just at the very end, I think the last five kilometers. But other than that, it, it starts out in a, in a rainforest. But again, I loved Kilimanjaro and I'll never forget it. And I remember, I think I wrote a whole blog about it because it was, it was definitely impacting. You started your year climbing Kilimanjaro and then you finished your year climbing Mount Aconcagua, the highest uh, peak in South America. Do you just want to share a little bit more about that experience and what that was like, yeah, heading over to, to climb Aconcagua? Aconcagua is definitely one of the hardest mountains and experiences I ever had. And I've, you know, in the past five years, I think I've climbed about uh, a little over 40 high altitude mountains. And Aconcagua is definitely another unforgettable experience. I trained one full year for that mountain. It's close to 23,000 feet. So the altitude is really incredible. But I trained so hard. I swam, lifted weights, ran. I carried about 50, 60 pounds on my backpack and walked for miles in preparation for that mountain. And thank goodness that that I did because um, I was also on the budget. (laughs) I'm always on the budget with all these mountain climbing expeditions. And I remember getting there and... um, I was I went with a company called RMI and it was a group of like 10 of us and everybody was paying these porters to carry their things and it was very expensive <laughs> so I'm like no 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 I trained for this so I'm just going to carry my stuff up as far as I can until the end if I possibly could and I was the only one in the in the 10 person team that carried my stuff all the way to the very end. And it was a good 60, 70 pounds on my back. And doing that at high altitude is definitely draining. But even at that, I think uh, half, half of my team got evacuated and some experienced climbers because of pulmonary edema, which was super scary. You have to trek into base camp. And once you trek into base camp, you have to pass a physical by the medical doctors there. And one of the things that they did was um, take your blood pressure. And one of my teammates' blood pressure was way, I mean, about to have a heart attack. And he had just summited a few months prior Denali. So an experienced climber, and um, he had to be evacuated. His blood pressure didn't come down the next day, even after medication. So he had to be helicoptered out. And my tent mate, right at high camp, 
also got pulmonary edema and had to get um, evacuated. So it was definitely a reality check <laughs> of what could happen in a high altitude mountain. I think that one of the ones when I summited, it was so crazy because I'm jumping a little bit all over the place. I remember that when I got to Mendoza, to Argentina, I remember like visualizing the whole experience and especially the summit. I saw myself on the summit with the American flag. And when I actually did summit, I remember going over to my guide and like having like this confused face. And he's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I did this already. I was here. <laughs> he's like, um, it's probably the high altitude. <laughs> he's like, you're, you're probably not thinking right. But I remember, and I did the whole pose. I took the American flag out. I had the summit picture, but all of that experience, like I lived it in my head. Like I just visualized it. I don't know. But, um, and I spent, uh, was it 14, 15 days on the mountain? It was my first time that long on the mountain. And crazy enough, the first night back in the hotel, I couldn't sleep. It was just like, like I wanted to be back in that cold tent. <laughs> and it took me a couple of weeks once I got back to New York and everything. It's just like, it took me a while to just get back to reality, to be back to normal. But Aconcagua was yeah, definitely very special. And when I got back to base camp, the people there were congratulating me and everything. And they were like, where do you train? The, you know, congratulations. I'm like, um, in New York, in the Catskills. <laughs> And they started laughing and they're like, uh, if you don't want to tell us, you don't have, you don't have to tell us, but not New York. I'm like, yeah, I live, train, work, everything in New York at sea level. So yeah. So those things are definitely things that just keep motivating me to, to do these things in the mountains because somehow, some way I felt like I was meant, that's what I was meant to do. You mentioned uh, the word budget, and it's one of the things that I do like to talk about is the money side of things, you know, paying, affording to to pay to climb these mountains. But how do you figure that out? Are you doing it from savings? Are you getting sponsorship? You know, how, do you, how do you afford it? Since living on my own, I've always um, worked super hard, and I've done my best to budget, to save money. It hasn't been easy, uh, easy at all. Mountaineering is not a cheap <laughs> sport. It's very expensive. The gear, I mean, if you don't have the proper gear, you can literally lose your toes and your, and your fingers and get frostbite. It definitely has not been easy. Uh, last year for Elbrus, um, a year and a half ago, was the first time I got sponsorship. And it's because on my own, I wrote so many letters. And my marketing angle is, listen, this could be the first Latina from New York City to summit the seven summits of the world. It's It should be a pretty big deal. <laughs> So Big Agnes donated my four season expedition tent, which is like a thousand dollars that I definitely did not have the money to spend on on something like that. And Petzl has donated a, some, some of my climbing gear. But other than that, I haven't received the real proper sponsorship needed for that. And I honestly, you know, for Everest, the climbing permit alone is $11,000. That's more than any of the expeditions that I've been on um, have cost. Just the permit. The whole expedition is something like $60,000. So, <laughs> so without the proper sponsorship, there's no possible way I could do that. Even, you know, I work already as it is three jobs, even with working three jobs, I wouldn't be able to afford that. So I have faith <laughs> that somehow the proper sponsorship will come along because that is my dream. And um, I, up until this point, there's nothing that I have started that I haven't finished. And this is definitely something that I feel is, um, you know, my journey. 
how do you maintain your motivation levels when you do deal with setbacks? Like, what keeps you going? What keeps you focused? What keeps you going after this your your life dream? I must say, um, Sarah, that I have you know a lot of people don't know that and don't uh, I don't fully understand that. They only see things from the outside and not what's going on in the inside. But I have lived through many, many setbacks, you know, um, having the background that I did with my family, with my father, um, living on my own, leaving home. I've had numerous injuries, you know, a lot of things um, that were unfair, especially in boxing that happened. And sometimes I don't get the sponsorship that I want. And, you know, and I have to budget and save and, and I'm not able to do certain things that I want to do. I always grateful um, for my faith. When I don't understand something and something doesn't make sense, I pray. I pray and I pray a lot because especially on the mountains, when you're in danger and the weather is not going your way and things like that, I mean, there's just, this is the way I feel. If you don't believe in the higher power, then it's going to be a tough, tough road. So that's pretty much it. It's, um, it's pretty simple, but at the same time, complicated for many people, I believe. I'm very grateful that even throughout this pandemic, I have been safe. I haven't uh, caught the virus, um, knock on wood, until now. I've had my job. Um, many people here in New York have suffered um, losing their jobs and whatnot, getting hours cut. And I must say that even since March, since the pandemic here in New York City started, I've ha- I've never been busier. I've ha- I have my my still have my jobs, and I volunteer. I started volunteering for food pantries in March. I volunteer on a weekly basis, and that continues to um, help me see part of my purpose. You know, of helping. You know, in any way that I could, volunteering, and then through my uh, mountaineering experience. Through my job, it definitely is something that's very uh, fulfilling and rewarding. What's your day to day life like in New York? You know, how do you fit your your training in, and and your you know your are you still boxing? Are you still doing your your martial arts? You know, how does that all work? The one thing that I must say is that, you know, I, besides my dog, (laughs) I don't have children and I'm not married. So I know that people with that type of responsibility would have less time. I have always done this. I make the most out of my time. I wake up usually about 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. I pray first. I write, then I do my training. And then and I do like a two, depending on what I'm training for, but I get at least two hours in of training in the morning. And that training consists of either weight training and running, plyometrics, speed workouts, and, and whatnot. For the moment, while I'm doing focusing on the mountain climbing, I haven't retired from boxing, but I'm focusing fully on the mountaineering because it's my passion and that's what I want to accomplish at the moment. So um, so the boxing has taken a backseat for now. So yeah, that, uh, so my day starts from like 3.30 in the morning until like about 10 o'clock at night. I do the most with those hours as possible. Is your next mountain Denali? Is that the the next goal? Yes. How's that all coming along? I was supposed to go last year, but because of the pandemic, no permits to anyone was granted last year. As of now, it seems uh, many companies are trying to fulfill their spots uh, to go to Denali. Uh, Next week, I'm going to file for a permit. And if everything goes well, I will go in June. That will be the next of the seven summits. But in between, you know, there will be other mountains that I will use as training. And most likely in Utah, 
which has good terrain and good altitude for me to train. So, and if I can, I will try to perhaps go back to Ecuador for one or two trips to use as, as training for Denali. And Patty, how can people follow along with your Seven Summits journey? Uh, yes, it's very important for me to document. So I do, I have done a, a pretty good job of documenting my training and the mountains that I'm climbing on Instagram at Climbing for a Dream. That's very specific to just the mountaineering. Um, my personal Instagram is at Patty Boxer 12 which has a little bit of everything from my volunteering to my work, to my writing, to my dog, to my climbing and my running, a little bit of everything. And then I have my personal website is www.climbingforadream.com. Oh, fantastic. And Fassi, I'd love for you to leave our listeners the final words of advice for other women out there who want to dream big and they want to go after these big challenges. You know, what advice would you have for them? For other women and for anybody who wants to go after their goals and accomplish their dreams, running a marathon could be their Everest mountain. It's whatever is in your heart. And I think that putting yourself first and your dreams first is not selfish. It's actually something that should be done in order for your self-esteem and in order for you to be the best mom, partner, daughter, friend possible. Because if not, then that could turn into resentment. So, you know, putting yourself first is actually something incredibly important and you deserve it. You know, you're stronger than you think and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Patricia, thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast to share more about your life and your passions. It's been absolutely inspiring to speak with you. Thank you so much for having me. Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed the episode with Paddy Boom Boom. What an absolute inspiration, running a marathon at 16, climbing mountains, becoming a professional boxer, following her dreams and just getting after it. Amazing top tips and great pieces of advice. Everything that we have talked about today will be available in the show notes at toughgirlchallenges.com. So please do go and check it out. If you haven't already, I'd love for you to leave a five-star review on whichever platform you listen to the Tough Girl podcast. That helps other people find the podcast and hopefully think, you know what? let's take a listen to the tough girl podcast and see what it's all about and hopefully they'll listen to one episode and be like oh my god this is so good and then they'll download more and then they'll tell tell a friend about it and then they'll start thinking right what's the next adventure and challenge that I want to take in what's what's my first step going to be what do I need to do to make my dreams happen because this is what the tough girl podcast is all about it's about motivating and inspiring you encouraging you to take your next steps and it's about increasing the amount of female role models in the media a massive thank you to all the patrons and supporters out there the tough girl podcast is sponsorship and ad free so if you would like to support the work that I'm doing then please visit patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash tough girl podcast make sure you hit that subscribe button and tell one friend Take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.